<laughs> Outlaws, and gangsters in particular, have enthralled audiences since the early days of cinema. They're the original anti-heroes, seducing us with an escape from the rules of ordinary society, breaking the law without consequence, and fulfilling our desire for power and respect. On many occasions, these characters follow their own rules and their own code of honour, and perhaps that's why, in the end, we admire them. However wrong they may be, they're willing to die for their principles. For many, Hollywood gangsters are perhaps the most iconic in cinema. In the last few decades, Pacino's Michael Corleone from The Godfather or Tony Montana from Scarface are perhaps the most influential. But ask any fan of British cinema who their gangster hero is, and chances are they'll say just one name, Jack Carter. Bloody well tell me who sent you. You're a big man, but you're in bad shape. You admit it's a full-time job. Now behave yourself. All right? All right. Get Carter features Michael Caine as Jack Carter, a violent heavy for the London mob. After spending most of his adult life in London, Carter is forced to go back to his native Newcastle following the sudden and suspicious death of his brother. Carter begins to ruffle feathers to say the least, as former associates and organised crime members in his hometown conspire to cover up the true circumstances of his brother's death culminating in an explosive tale of revenge and retribution directed by the undersung British director Mike Hodges. Hodges' Get Carter is a cult classic, but he's also known for directing the sci-fi adventure Flash Gordon. However, he would revisit dark, noirish tales with his later work, including Pulp, Croupier and I'll Sleep When I'm Dead, the last of which serving as almost a spiritual sequel to Get Carter. Get Carter was a striking debut for Hodges, but it would also serve to lionise its leading man as a British icon. Three, two, one, go! British cinema has created many icons, but none have had the same everyman appeal and the ability to endure as Michael Caine. Well, you all settled in? Right, we can begin. There are very few actors that have been in so many classic movies, including Zulu, Gambit, The Italian Job, The Man Who Would Be King, Educating Rita and Hannah and Her Sisters, to name but a few. But also, Kane can give Harrison Ford's holy trinity of Han Solo, Indiana Jones and Rick Decker to run for his money, with countless iconic roles, including Alfie, Harry Palmer, which was essentially Kane's James Bond, Sherlock Holmes, Scrooge, and most recently Alfred the Butler in Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy. Kane has even fought Jaws. Oh, shit! Every generation has a cultural reference point for Michael Caine, but it seems that Jack Carter was something different. It allowed Caine to explore his darker side and draw upon the surroundings he grew up in to create a British gangster that was not only feared, but authentic. The legacy of Michael Caine as Carter would inspire not only a renaissance of British gangster films from the 80s to the present, but would also coincide with perhaps the grittier and pulpy neo-noir gangster films of the 70s. American film noir of the 40s would introduce audiences to the seedy world of criminality, gangsters and hard-boiled detectives, as well as exploring feelings of paranoia, betrayal and revenge, all wrapped up in a shadowy and expressionistic world. Neo-noir would reignite the genre in the 70s with such movies as Roman Polanski's Chinatown, as well as the stylish neo-noirs of the 80s. However, neo-noir could be traced back just a little bit earlier than that. British directors John Borman and P.T. Yates would channel the noirish themes of corruption and betrayal in the late 60s with Point Blank and Bullet with their hard-boiled tales. Integrity is something you sell the public. You sell whatever you want, but don't sell it here tonight. Frank, we must all compromise. Bullshit. Get the hell out of here now. Get Carter would pay homage to film noir in its own way. As we watch Carter ride the train to Newcastle, he's seen clutching a copy of Raymond Chandler's Farewell My Lovely, and perhaps Carter's trench coat is a subtle homage to famous detective Philip Marlowe. Throughout the story, Carter himself 
becomes an unwitting detective as he tries to solve the mystery of his brother's death. And not only does he meet unscrupulous, corrupt individuals along the way, he also encounters his fair share of untrustworthy femme fatales that attempt to blind him with seduction as he seeks the truth. What does he want that great big country place for? Entertaining. What kind of entertaining? <laughs> no, you're asking. Mike Hodges' grittier, no-nonsense approach would strip away the expressionistic style of traditional film noir. Following Get Carter, and perhaps even The French Connection, there would be a slew of stripped-down and gritty American neo-noir and gangster tales that I can't help but feel were influenced by Hodges' Get Carter in some way. These include Charlie Varick, The Friends of Eddie Coyle, The Outfit, Prime Cut, Night Moves, and framed. All of these films center around a main protagonist in a smaller town or city who's betrayed or hunted due to a double cross. Much like Kane's Carter, these characters lack the polish and glamour of Bogart, but they were deconstructed versions of the doomed film noir anti-hero. The only reason I came back to this crap house was to find out who did it. And I'm not leaving till I do. Do you understand? Hey. Hello, Jack. You bitch. It was you who told them I was here, wasn't it? Hey. When we first meet Carter, we immediately sense his strength. He has a piercing stare and doesn't partake in the sleazy small talk as his cohorts watch pornographic slides. We see that he is in some ways a man of some moral character and he's also comfortable standing alone. This is further consolidated when he refuses request to not go to Newcastle as his bosses fear he may stir up trouble between the mobs of the North and the South. We don't want you to go up the North, Jack. No. You work for us, Jack. You know we're connected with the Newcastle mob. I'd hate you to screw it up. What are you going for? To find out what happened. Look, your brother's dead and gone. They're hard nuts up there, Jack. They won't take kindly to someone from London poking his nose in. Too bad. When Carter arrives in Newcastle, he immediately stands out as a decadent Londoner among local drinkers, and again, we see that he's not afraid of drawing attention to himself as the outsider when he orders a drink. It's clear that he wants to not only mark his arrival, but also mark his territory. Find a bitter. In a thin glass. As the story unfolds, we discover that Carter is actually from the town, but has been away so long that not only has he lost his accent, but he's also lost a sense of who he could trust. Initially, he's on the hunt and is the aggressor, but slowly he realizes that a conspiracy is afoot and that he's in fact being hunted. And not only by the local mobs he's disrupting, but also by his so-called allies back home in London. As an enforcer, however, we see how fearless Carter is at confronting all these predators, not only with veiled threats, but also outpourings of explosive and effective violence, mainly fueled by his frustration, but also his disgust at what he sees as immoral people. You knew what I'd do, didn't you, Elf? <laughs> Christ, I didn't kill him! I know you didn't kill him! I know! Take your bra off. Stop it, darling. No. Go on. Carter is a complex character full of interesting contradictions. Despite, in essence, being a violent thug and a womanizer, we empathize with him as he appears to be the lesser of two evils. Unlike those around him, he's a criminal with a moral code and seems to have principles, and perhaps it's his contempt for the people that he works for that justifies him cheating with his boss's wife, played by Britt Eklund. At the end of the famous phone sex scene, we get a sense, however, that his secrets are slowly being unveiled and his employers are catching on to his lack of loyalty. What's the matter, you got gut trouble or something? No, darling. Just doing my exercises. Listen, Janet, um, Giles just walked in. Must ring off. Yeah, I'll come tomorrow. Save it till Sunday. 
as he meets the various criminals and shady characters of Newcastle who try to portray themselves as respectable citizens with their fancy cars and lavish homes. We notice Carter's hostility. The interactions are friendly on the surface, but veil not only threats, but the truth about the cause of Carter's brother's death. And Carter's quest becomes not only about delivering justice and eventually revenge, it ultimately becomes about redemption and Carter trying to make peace with the past. Near the beginning of the movie, as we watch Carter ride the train to Newcastle, it's almost as if he's travelling back in time and being hurtled into the past. Once back home, it's not long until we discover that Carter had betrayed his brother by having an affair with his wife and essentially destroying his family. The only remains of Carter's family is his niece Doreen and due to the affair, it's also implied that Doreen might be Carter's daughter. Either way, Carter feels protective of the very naive Doreen and even offers to take her away from Newcastle and start a new life with him in South America. He does this perhaps as a way to restore the family unit that he feels he destroyed. What are you going to do? Live with Margaret? Well, why won't you come with us to South America? My fiancé wouldn't mind. And that's how your dad would have liked it. Towards the end of the film, Doreen becomes the so-called smoking gun of the mystery. Carter discovers that she was featured in a pornographic film made by the very same criminals who've been deceiving him and trying to kill him all along. And it was also the very same criminals that killed his brother when he vowed to expose them when he found out the truth. The girl's name was Doreen, that's all I know. And you didn't know her last No. Time? Well, it's Carter. That's my name. Following this revelation, Carter doles out brutal justice, killing his enemies and getting the rest of them arrested. I want you to drink all of that. Do you understand? Drink it all. Just like it was with my brother Frank. Go on, sir. Drink up. <coughs> For the final act of vengeance, Carter punishes the sleazy Eric Pace. He avenges his brother's death by forcing Pace to get drunk and then beating him to death with the family heirloom, Carter's iconic shotgun. As Pace is dropped into the sea, we see that Carter feels vindicated and that he's ready to lay his demons to rest. And as he begins to throw the shotgun into the sea, the moment is suddenly interrupted as Carter is shot dead by a sniper's bullet. And it's here that we realise that Carter was not only trying to come to terms with his past, Carter is the past. Carter's moral code and desire for family values represents an old England that seems to be at odds with his enemies who see financial gain in progress. Carter on the other hand is not driven by money. Throughout the film we see him compensate people generously for any inconvenience. He is instead driven by what he believes is right and no matter how many times he is warned to stop and go back to London we only see him become more determined. Despite his protests his homecoming appears to represent a desire to stay in the past. However the mobs he works for are embracing the future and the change in values. The changing attitude towards sex and people turning a blind eye to corruption only brings them more profit and ultimately more power. As we watch Carter get washed away by the waves, we see honour and morals get washed away with him, marking the death of the past, the death of old England and an entry into an uncertain and corrupt future. So that's my take on Get Carter. Thanks for watching. See you next time. What are you going to do? I'm going to sit in the car and whistle Rule Britannia. You're coming back. How can I stay away?